So let me just share, let me go live on YouTube and then we'll go right into this. Okay, so we're gonna get into session one of our seven day keto challenge. I'm gonna dive deep into how to do keto the right way in 2022 and beyond. This is gonna be a life-changing video for you to watch. If you're watching on YouTube, you're getting a special live look into session one of our seven-day keto kickstart challenge. Now, if you wanna watch the other six sessions and all the cool things we're doing and be a part of the giveaways and the Q and A's and all that, you have to sign up for the challenge, which is free if you go to ketocampchallenge.com. So let's get into this lesson. I hope everybody has their pen and paper handy. If you don't, grab it right now because this is gonna make such a difference for you in your life. What we're gonna be learning is this. Why keto is not a diet. I'm gonna debunk a lot of the myths out there regarding keto because we know keto is super popular and there's a lot of misinformation regarding keto. So we're gonna talk about why keto is not a diet. I'm gonna get into the history of keto. I'm gonna give you some simple keto exchanges that transform your results. Whether you're new to keto or hit a plateau, these little swaps will make a big, big difference for you. I'm gonna explain the difference between burning sugar and burning fat, the difference between fat adaptation, keto adaptation, and much more. I'm also gonna explain some really cool, interesting, historic facts about ketosis. You're gonna be blown away by that. Here's where I wanna start with you. 150,000, okay? You probably heard me share this stat before. What does that mean? What is a, why am I showing you this 150,000? That is the average of how many people die on planet Earth every single day, okay? Yesterday, 150,000 people fought for their last breath on planet earth and they lost that battle today 150,000 people will fight for their last breath on planet earth and they will lose that battle i don't say this to be all negative and doom and gloom i say this because hey you're watching me right now whether wherever you are in the world you hear me you see me everybody put your right hand on your heart take a deep breath feel it beat, that heartbeat is a miracle. That alone is something to be grateful for. And vitamin G, gratitude, is the strongest, most important, most powerful vitamin you will ever take. And just understanding that 150,000 people die every single day, the fact that you're alive right now and breathing and watching me and hearing me, that in itself is something to be grateful for. The chances of you even being alive on planet Earth and being born into this world is 400 trillion to one. You're a miracle. Every second that you breathe is a miracle. So let's start with vitamin G. And I'm super grateful to be on session one of our seven-day keto challenge. Allow me one second here. My dog is really distracting me. I got to get him out of the room. Give me two seconds. Hey, come here. Yeah, I kicked my dog out of the room because he was annoying me. <laughs> I'll bring him back shortly. So I'm going to start where you probably didn't expect for me to start. And that is talking about the mind. Because I believe you got to inner size before you exercise. Yes, I'm going to give you the exact blueprint that I've taught tens and tens of thousands of people to achieve amazing results with their health. I'm going to teach you how to do keto. I'm gonna teach you how to do fasting. I'm gonna teach you how to do keto flexing. I'm gonna teach you all of that during the next seven days. But if you don't have it going on in here, in here, right in that heart, right in your mind, right in your thoughts, it's gonna be hard to heal your body. There's a thermostat. And many of you, I've read every single one of your comments, okay, in the Facebook group. I was talking to Alina prior to this live stream about how we're just so grateful to have so many of you from all different parts of the world, all, all different walks of life, different health challenges, different goals participating. We have thousands of you participating in this challenge and you're sharing with us so authentically your struggles and your goals. But how many of you could relate? And I want you to type in, I can relate 
if this relates to you. You have goals, you have plans, whether it's health or, or whatever it is, but you have these goals and you make some progress, you lose some weight, you, you make some, some ground, and then you get sidetracked and you sabotage yourself and you reset back to where you were before. Two steps back, excuse me, one step forward, two steps back, or two steps forward, two steps back. And you feel like a push, pull. Can you relate to that? Let me know in the chat, in the chat box. I can relate. I see you, Edna, Barbie, uh, Jow. I see you, Asher. I see you, Cynthia, Shalini, Veronica, Amelia. I could relate to that too. Now, the number one reason this happens is because you have an internal thermostat. And there's a great book that came out many, many years ago called Psycho-Cybernetics that talks all about this mechanism in the body by Maxwell Maltz. But I'm going to explain how it works in a few seconds. You see, you have two parts of your mind. You have the conscious mind. I'm consciously aware that I'm looking at this video and I see your comments on here. But then you have subconscious mind. And as you can see here in this photo, 90% of your results are going to come from that subconscious mind. But the subconscious mind runs on autopilot. Let me give you an example. When you first started to drive a car, you were all conscious mind. Oh my gosh, 10 and 2, 10 and 2, you're holding the steering wheel, the clutch, you know, you're looking a full three second stop at the stop sign. Like you, you were totally conscious mind. And all of a sudden you do it enough times, you do it enough times. And all of a sudden you could drive 45 minutes to a different city listening to a book on the phone and not even realize how you got to that location. How, how, can you relate to that? You drove to a place and you're like, I didn't even know how I got here. I just autopilot, subconscious mind took over. Most of our results are coming from the subconscious mind. And if you don't retrain this subconscious mind and change your paradigm, that word paradigm is super important. It is your set of activities that just happens on autopilot. Then you're going to keep taking two steps forward and two steps back and sabotaging yourself. So how do you retrain the paradigm? How do you retrain the subconscious mind? Well, you don't get what you want in life. You get what you are. And what you are are the thoughts that you think every single day. By changing your thoughts, changing the feelings connected to those thoughts, you change your paradigm, you change your subconscious mind, and you finally break through these self-sabotaging behaviors. I'm going to explain how this works with this analogy. Before I get to that analogy, understand this. The average human being thinks 60,000 thoughts every single day. 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts from the day before, which are typically negative thoughts, what I call stinking thinking. I got news for you. If your thinking is stinking, your dreams are shrinking. Health dreams, financial dreams, relationship dreams because you become what you think about most of the time. But here's something powerful. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. My mentor, the late and great Dr. Wayne Dyer said that. And if you think this is, Ben, this is getting woo woo. Let's get into the research. Give me the macros. How do you do keto? No, no, no. This is where it's at. You change this and everything else you're going to learn during these seven days will make a big, big difference for you. If you don't get this right, you're going to keep self-sabotaging yourself. And if you want some of the science behind what I'm talking about, let's get into the science. There's a part of your brain called the reticular activation system. Now, if we're all on the same page here and you're following along with me and you're not distracted, I want you to type in R-A-S. I want to make sure you're engaged and you're not distracted. This is so important. This is life changing. So type in R-A-S if you're following along with me. I'm going to take a sip of water. Yeah, Ursula, I love Dr. Wayne Dyer. Yeah, Lisa. Yeah, Joanne. Yes, Alina. Okay, Barbie, let's go. Okay. Now, the RAS is a self-seeking selective mechanism, if you will. And here's how it works. Okay. This is why 
when you, you focus on what's not working for you, the stinking thinking, why can I lose the weight? Why can't I get off medic my medication? Why doesn't keto work for me? It works for everybody else. Why negative thinking, stinking? You're giving that RAS negativity and the universe will give you more things to be negative about. Let's say you want to buy a car and that car is a beautiful red Tesla. Look, if you hate Teslas, substitute it for whatever car you love. But let's say it's a red Tesla. So here's how it works. You're on the internet. You're on autotrader.com. You're looking for red Teslas for weeks, searching for red Teslas. And you find one in a dealership close to your house. So you drive to the dealership and you're like, okay, Today's the day I buy my red Tesla. And you go and you negotiate a great deal and you buy this beautiful red Tesla. You drive it off the lot. You're driving home on the highway. Look at me. I'm such a badass. I got my red Tesla. Excuse my language. And all of a sudden you notice a red Tesla zips past you and you thought, whoa, that person just bought the same, has the same car as me. I just bought this. That's a coincidence. You just keep driving. You got a red light. Still haven't gotten home yet. Just bought the car. You got a red light and you notice a red Tesla pulls right next to you and you're thinking, that's random. I, I just saw two red Teslas. I just bought a red Tesla. Anyways, you think it's random and you just keep driving. And then every single day, week after week, you see red Teslas everywhere. Now, did everybody buy a red Tesla because you bought one? You thought you were cool, but now everybody has one. No, they didn't buy it because of you. The, Tesla, the red Teslas were always there but now you've activated the RAS in your brain to see it. Meaning when you focus on what's working for you and focus on all the things you want to work for you, gratitude, you get more things to be grateful for. This is how it works. What you appreciate, appreciates. But when you're focusing on what's not working for you and all the negativity and all the bad things happening in the world, you'll see more. RAS will give you more things that you're going to be angry about. So at the beginning of the live session, I said, this is a no negativity zone. I saw somebody say, oh, StreamYard sucks. We're going to have zero tolerance for any negativity. And no, 99% of you were saying positive things, but that one thing I saw. So if you keep focusing on what's not working and what you're angry about, RAS will go to work for you. But when you focus on what you're grateful for, what you appreciate begins to appreciate. So what's one thing that you're grateful for today? Let me know in the chat box. What is one thing you're grateful for today? Now, before I bring you into this new world of what we do here at Keto Camp and how we teach keto and how we teach fasting, I'm going to share a story with you. Now, this story is from the Bible. If, you don't, if you're not religious, this is not a religious share per se. It's, it's a story from the Bible that can relate to anybody, no matter what your belief is. And I see your comments about being what you're grateful for. I love it. Before I take you to this new land, I need to change your subconscious mind. I need to change your attitude. And the attitude is a result of your thoughts, feelings, and actions. But a lot of what you've been taught is very different and doesn't work. And we need to change your consciousness. And here's what Moses did in the Bible to change the consciousness of his followers, okay? Moses was in the desert. He was taking a group of his followers and he wanted to, Moses wanted to lead this group into a new land. And Moses was a very smart guy. Before he took them to new land, he wanted to change their consciousness. He wanted to change their attitude, their thoughts, their feelings, and vibrations. Similar to what I want to do for you before we embark on this journey. And they're walking in the desert, and his followers are getting really pissed off and frustrated. They're thinking, Moses, we're going to die out here, dude. There's no water. There's no food. There's no land in sight. So they go up to Moses and say, Moses, we're going to die out here, man. There's no food. There's no water. There's no land. So Moses looks at them and says, hey, you go pray to your God for some rain. So they go and they pray. Hours later, still no food, still no water, still no land in sight. And they all walk up to Moses, pissed off, saying, Moses, God has forsaken us. We are going to die out here. And Moses takes a step back. 
And he looks around, he looks behind him. And Moses says, where are the ditches? And they look at him and say, what do you mean ditches? And Moses said, if you expected rainfall, you would have dug the ditches to collect the rainwater. You see, they didn't really change their consciousness. They, they didn't ex expect great things to happen. And as a result, they didn't get what they expected. But if you change your consciousness and expect this to work for you, then guess what? It will. Faith and fear both demand for you to believe in something you cannot see. Why not choose the positive? Why not choose the faith? Fear could have two meanings. Fear could mean face everything and run or face everything and rise. Which one are you going to choose today? Let me know in the chat box. Faith or fear? And before we could even change that, we have to change the people around us. Because let's, as you do keto, as you do fasting, you probably experienced this already. You're going to have friends and family members who say keto is going to cause a heart attack. Fasting is going to put you in starvation mode. That Benazadi is a quack. You're going to have people say this. What I say is that they are crabs in a bucket. You could put 50 crabs in a bucket, leave that bucket overnight without a lid, come back the next morning and all, cra all 50 crabs will still be there. And you might be thinking, why didn't the crabs just try to break free? They did. Anytime, anytime a crab tried to break free and crawl out of that bucket, the other crabs would see it and claw it back down. So who are the crabs in your life? Part of your action step later on is to determine the crabs. And I'm going to share with you an exercise later on how to do so. Now, I'm going to give you a perfect example because who you spend your time with is who you become. You become your environment. You want to see how powerful this really is? Okay, let me show this to you. There was an amazing experiment done uh, on fleas on a jar, in a jar, excuse me. So look at this. This is going to blow your mind. And this is going to show you exactly how powerful your environment is. Okay, check this out. Training fleas requires a glass jar with a lid. The fleas are placed inside the jar and the lid is then sealed. They are left undisturbed for three days. Then, when the jar is opened, the fleas will not jump out. In fact, the fleas will never jump higher than the level set by the lid. Their behavior is now set for the rest of their lives. And when these fleas reproduce, their offspring will automatically follow their example. I mean, how powerful was that? Not only did the fleas, they were conditioned now by their environment to believe they're stuck there, even though the jar was removed, but their offspring was born and it flew in the same pattern. Like that is, that should give you goosebumps and should inspire you to really control your environment. And I see your comments. Marcy's like, wow. Michelle says, wow. Shalini says, wow. Lois says, wow. Beth says, I want to break free from the flea pattern. Cynthia says, wow, don't be a flea, says Facebook user. Hey, Facebook user, connect to StreamYard. I want to see who you are. Jennifer says, wow. Barbara says, wow. Marta says, wow. So that's a perfect example, right? So well, let's get a little bit more into what we're talking about here. So here's who I was. I mean, some of you know my story and I'm real, I'm real curious, you know, just real quick. For those watching, how many of you are familiar with my work? Like, you know who I am. You've been following me for months or years. Or how long have you been following me, I should ask? Like, let me know. If you're brand new to my work, type in brand new. If it's been a month, type in a month. If it's been over a year, type in a year. I just want to get an idea of who's on here. So let me know if you're brand new to my work or you recently discovered me or it's been years. I'm going to share real quick my story as you, as you put that. Do not know your history, says Debbie, over a year. I know that Edna, good to see you on here. Tell Georgia, said hello. Jose, good to see you on here. Okay, great. 
Well, I'm going to just share my story real quick, just because I want you to know a little bit more about me. I see there's some new on here. I see Amanda this is brand new, newbie, newbie, newbie. Cool. Okay. Well, this is who I was. Let me go back a second. Obese, suicidal, confused by nutritional jargon. Now, I carry my weight really well, but I was obese here. I'm six foot two, so I carry it really well. But this is me at the age of 23 years old, 250 pounds, 34% body fat, looking on the internet for ways to kill myself. I looked on the internet many, many times for ways to end my suffering. I wanted to give up, but thank God I didn't because I kept thinking about my mother. I kept thinking about all the devastation she would have to deal with and it stopped me from taking my life. But it was a vicious circle. Look for ways to kill myself, stop myself. Here are some photos of me, 23, 24 years old, very much unhealthy, addicted to pizza, addicted to sugar. I had extreme sugar addiction, extreme food addiction, extreme video game addiction, uh, drug addiction. And I knew, this is my 23rd birthday here, I knew my life was headed down a destructive path. So I started to read books. And look, I was a bad student growing up. I dropped out of college, excuse me. Yeah, I dropped out of college, but I also dropped out of high school. I only read the bare minimum to kind of get by. At the age of 24 years old, I said, all right, I gotta start reading, making changes, and it started by reading books. So I read one book, which led to five books, which led to 20 books. I started to read amazing authors like Dr. Wayne Dyer, Bob Proctor, Earl Nightingale, Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar, Tony Robbins, Lisa Nichols, Darren Hardy, Jack Canfield. And it really opened up a whole new world to me. And everything changed the second I took responsibility. It is literally impossible to take responsibility and still be angry. I said these three words out loud, I am responsible. And in that second, my thoughts, my feelings, and my actions changed for the better. You see, up until taking responsibility, I was the victim. I was blaming my genetics, my enabling family members. I was blaming the president. I was blaming whatever I could get my hands on. But I said, no longer will I be the victim of my history from right now and forever. I am the victor of my destiny. So as we embark on these seven days, I want everybody watching me right now, whether you're watching live or the replay, I want you to write and take responsibility with me only if you mean it and write the words, I am responsible in the chat box right now. Who's taking responsibility with me? I see Michelle is. I see Sherry is. Barbara says, amen. Angie says, I am responsible. Cynthia says, I am responsible. Ed says, be victorious. Rebecca, I love it. Rob, I see all your amazing comments. Zippor, Tammy, Janine, Nicole. That's right. That's right. Now for me, Nine months after I took responsibility, I lost 80 pounds. I went from 250 pounds on the left to 170 pounds on the right. I went from 34% body fat on the left to 6% body fat on the right. I went from 38 size in my pants to size 30. Finally carved out a physical six pack. Doesn't mean you're healthy. Most important thing, I achieved was that last line. I went from being mentally obese and bankrupt, broken, broken, to achieving a mental six pack. And that's what I want for all of you. And the fact that you're taking responsibility, that's the first step towards this transformation. So congratulations to those who have done it. Now, the real reason I'm with you today, that was my transformation. I went through that, that was back in 2008 that I lost all that weight, became a personal trainer, opened up a CrossFit gym, sold the CrossFit gym, became certified as a functional health practitioner, started working with all these amazing doctors and scientists. 
That was 13 years ago. I've been in this space for 13 years, studying on average three hours every single day for 13 years. I don't say that to impress you. I say it to impress upon you. I've been there. I'm still there. And I'm always growing and evolving. But that's not why I'm here with you today. This is why I'm here with you today. This is the real reason why I'm here with you. This is a photo of me and my dad. My dad's name is Sirus Azadi. Now, my dad immigrated to America, specifically Miami Beach, Florida, where I currently live, with my mom back in the 1970s. They came from Iran to Miami. I was born in 1984. Now, my dad followed a standard American diet, which we know is a stupid American diet. It's a very toxic diet. And my dad developed type 2 diabetes. How many of you watching right now have type 2 diabetes? Or how many of you know somebody with type 2 diabetes? At least 60% of Americans are type 2 diabetic or pre-diabetic. Somebody dies from diabetes, or I should say the complications of diabetes, every 10 seconds. I'm going to say that again. Somebody dies from the complications of diabetes every 10 seconds. My dad had type 2 diabetes. I didn't understand it. I followed the conventional wisdom. I took my dad to his doctor's appointments, and he got worse and worse and worse. And he ended up calling me November 2012. Ben, I'm having really bad neuropathy. I can't even walk to the restroom. I need help. Now, if you don't know what neuropathy is, it's a really bad nerve pain that the blood vessels are becoming damaged because of the high glucose and it becomes really painful. So for my dad, he couldn't even walk to the restroom. So I picked him up. Me and my mom picked up my dad, took him to the emergency room, Mount Sinai Medical Center here in Miami Beach. And we put him into the emergency room and in the hospital, being stressed out, being worried that he's going to get his feet amputated because 100,000 amputations take place every year in the United States. My dad knew that. Being stressed out in the hospital, my dad suffered a massive stroke, which left him paralyzed and it left him with the inability to speak. So the entire right side of his body was paralyzed. He couldn't speak anymore. And they transferred my dad to hospice care. And I visited my dad in hospice care every single week. And he was worse and worse and worse every single week as I visited my dad. But I did the best I can. I could. Played music for him. I consoled him. I told him how much I loved him. But I didn't know what to do. I couldn't help him at this point. But I could show up for him. And I kept showing up for him. And nine months into this, I remember walking into that hospice room. You know, it's interesting because the hospice my dad was in was actually First Street, Miami Beach, which is the middle of South Beach. And if you've ever been to South Beach, it's a beautiful place with all of these people, beautiful people, beautiful things. And in the middle is a hospice. And you walk in and it's like this energy gets sucked from you. It's a whole different world in there. People are dying. People are sick. My dad was one of them. And on this August 11th night, 2014, I walked into the bedroom or, or into the hospice room and my dad was in the worst shape I had ever seen him. And he was throwing up on himself. He was convulsing. He was, he was shaking. He was, he was in bad shape, the worst shape I had ever seen him in. So I, I ran in the hallway and I flagged down the nurses and I said, my dad needs help. And they came in and they started to work on him and clean him up and they did their thing. And a couple of hours later, he, he looked a lot better. You know, no more. He was cleaned up. He wasn't throwing up on himself anymore or shaking. But the, the look in his eyes, it was just very difficult to see that, to see the helplessness, to see just couldn't do anything to change it. So I remember I remember walking up to my dad, my dad that night, looking at him in the eyes, kissing him in the on the forehead. And I told him I'm always going to be his son. He's always going to be my dad. I told him how much I loved him. And then I said the words, hasta la vista, baby. The reason I said that is from the movie Terminator. My dad used to always say it to me growing up. When he said goodbye, it was his thing. So I drove home that night from the hospice, and I was crying in the car, got home. I cried at home, and I prayed that night, and I said the same prayer that I said every night for months, which was, God, please, please end my dad's suffering. 
It's been enough. He's suffered enough. Please end my father's suffering. There was something different about this prayer. There was an energy. There was a feeling. And I went to bed that night. Next day, literally less than 24 hours later, around 12 p.m. on that Tuesday, I get a phone call. And I look at the phone. And I see the caller ID. It's, it's the hospice. So I pick up the phone. And my heart sunk in my chest just seeing the caller ID, just seeing it was the hospice calling. And I pick up. And it's my father's nurse letting my, me know that my dad stopped breathing that morning and they couldn't bring him back and he had passed away. <clears throat> and I remember hanging up the phone. I remember just sitting there on the couch. My dog Ziggy, who I just kicked out of the room, he was there. He was looking at me and a wave of emotions that just came over me. If you've ever lost somebody you've loved, you, you, know, you know exactly what I'm sharing here. You know, part of me was relieved. I, I was relieved. I will never have to see my dad in that shape again. He's no longer suffering. He is with God. But the other part of me, the majority of me was just devastated. You know, why did I lose my dad? And I had a lot of questions. Had a lot of questions. I followed conventional wisdom. I listened to his doctors. I fed him the food they recommended and he got worse and he died. So why do we have an epidemic of disease? It's not just diabetes, it's cancer. One in three women are diagnosed in can with cancer in their lifetime. One in two men are diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. Alzheimer's, dementia, why do we have disease? Are we designed to develop disease? No. After that, my father passing, I set out to find the answers. And you know what? I have the answers. I have the solution. I know that my father would be alive right now to this day if I would have applied the information that I teach all over the world and I'm about to teach you today and all over this seven-day challenge. I know that. He would be alive. I also know that I was given that mountain so I could show the world that this mountain can be moved. You watching me right now, whether you have diabetes, whether you have rheumatoid arthritis, whether you have hypothyroidism, whether you have autoimmune disease, whether you just have fatigue and chronic fatigue or whatever symptom, the symptom is not the problem. My dad didn't die from diabetes. It's rare that anybody dies from diabetes. They die from the complications of the diabetes, the degeneration de de of the diabetes. Symptoms are not the problem. They are far removed from the problem. There is a cause and effect. Doctors do not acknowledge cause. They just look at effect. But I got to tell you this. The greatest physician you'll ever meet sits within your body, in every single one of your cells, and it's available to you 24-7. It's called the innate intelligence. There is no pill. There is no surgery. There is no shot. There's no supplement that can replace the innate intelligence. You just have to remove the interference and let that innate intelligence go to work for you. I'm going to share with you how to do that. So after my dad passed, it became a mission. It became my purpose. And now some of you know me, some of you don't, but I'm the founder of Keto Camp. Keto Camp is the leading authority on fasting and keto and what I call ancient healing strategies. Our mission at Keto Camp is to educate and to inspire 1 billion people on planet Earth. I have four best selling books. My latest is called Keto Flex, has been endorsed by some of the most amazing thought leaders in our space, including here's just a few Dr. Jason Fung, Megan Ramos, who's going to be here on Thursday on the challenge, uh, Dr. Ben Vickman, Dr. Mindy Peltz. Jimmy Moore. I mean, I could go Dr. Jockers, many, many more. Here's a you know speaker panel I was a part of with my mentor, Dr. Pompa, Thomas DeLauer, Dr. Mindy Pels, Sean Wells, Renee Bells uh, last year. So now I get to mastermind with these individuals and spread the message. And I'm super grateful that you're here with us because this information is going to help you be a genius. Einstein said intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. And I'm going to make sure every single one of you is a genius. We also have an amazing YouTube community. If you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash ketocamp, we have over 100,000 subscribers. 
you know, the, the stats out there are disgusting. Just when it comes to diabetes, 60%, I already said this, of Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic. 68% of these diabetics will end up with heart disease. 16% will have a stroke. 70% will end up with neuropathy. But look at that line, underline. All of those stats apply to those who are on medication. This is a medication nation. Most people don't understand that just because you're taking medication, it doesn't mean you're exempt from this set of statistics. Diabetes medication shows the sugar levels may be getting better, but your health and the diabetes gets worse. I'm not telling you to get off your medication right now. That's something you work with your doctor. And this is not medical advice. What I'm saying is let's look at the cause. Let's look at the cause is, and how can we apply ancient healing strategies like ketosis and fasting to help the body heal? We're going to talk about that. Here are some more nasty stats. And the common theme here is oxy oxygen deprivation. I already mentioned this, but I'm going to, I think it's worth repeating a little bit. One out of three women are diagnosed with cancer. That's according to cancer.org for men, one out of two diabetics. I already explained that, but by 2032, which is not too far from we're already in 2022 by 2032, it's predicted that one in two children will be born on the autism spectrum. And those are my resources down below CDC and cancer.org. If you want to go fact check it, this study showed that the survival five year survival rate for somebody who just goes through chemotherapy and nothing else is about 2.3% in Australia and just 2.1% in the US. And like, what if I told you the same food given to patients in the hospital going through chemotherapy is the same food that causes cancer to grow in the body? What if I told you human beings are the only species smart enough to create their own food and dumb enough to actually eat it? Truth is you cannot drug yourself to perfect health. What we need to do is for unlearn a lot of, a lot of the things we've been taught. Alvin Toffler said the illiterate of the 21st century is not those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. We're going to have to unlearn a lot of the things we've been taught to relearn how to really heal the body. Intellectuals solve problems. Geniuses prevent them. How many of you have watched Seinfeld before? Who's a Seinfeld fan? Let me know. If you know who this person is on the screen here. So Seinfeld is a, was a very popular show back in the nineties. I see Barbara, Sherry, Edna. Uh, there was a character on the show named George Costanza. Now George Costanza was getting terrible results in his life. And Jerry Seinfeld said, Hey, if everything you're doing is getting you poor results, why don't you just do everything opposite of what you've been doing? And George thought, what a great idea. I'm going to do everything opposite. So he saw a girl at the restaurant bar. And in the past, he would just, you know, be too shy to walk up to her or he would walk up to her and make a whole bunch of lies up. So he said, I'm going to do the opposite. So he would walk up to the girl and tap her on the shoulder and she'd turn around and he'd say, hi, I'm George Costanza. I'm broke and I live with my parents. It's so good to meet you. And she would say, hey, I'm Lori, come take a seat. <laughs> everything in his life started to improve when he started to do everything opposite of what he had been doing up until that point. Meaning, whenever you see the conventional wisdom, what, what the government promotes when it comes to your health, what you see the mainstream media promote when it comes to your health, do the exact opposite, the George Costanza effect, and you're going to get better results in your life. The innate intelligence is there to work for you, but there's two types of people. And this is a very important part of the lecture. And I know we're going to get into the keto stuff very soon, but here's an important part. There's two types of people out there. There are the three percenters and the 97 percenters. Now the 97% of the population, they're looking for shortcuts, toxic pills, surgeries, etc. They are not getting results. They don't acknowledge cause and effect. They're looking just at effect. They're treating symptoms. Then we have the three percenters. The three percenters get amazing results. The three percenters 
heal their body. The three percenters get diagnosed by their doctor with a terminal disease. And they look back at their doctor and say, no, the disease is not terminal. Your ability to help me is terminal. And they go on to heal themselves. I was not always a three percenter, but I am now. And my question to you is this, and I want you to be 100% honest with me. Are you a three percenter or are you a 97 percenter? Cynthia is a three percenter. Pauline's a three percenter. Beth is a three percenter. Tamika is a three percenter. Joanna is a three percenter. I fired my doctor. All right, Agatha, that's what you got to do sometimes. Three percenter says support. I knew that. Veronica, Marie, Maria. I know Dr. Susan is. Hey, Susan. Deanna. Yep, there we go. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. Yep. So here's the truth. If you're not a three percenter, if you identify as a 97 percenter and you're looking for shortcuts, this challenge, my work will not help you. I mean, don't even participate. Leave the live stream right now. I will not be offended. I could only help. We could only help the three percenters. So I love that you took action there with the 3%. Good job. Three steps to healing your body. Number one, identify the interference. Number two, remove the interference. Number three, allow your amazing body to heal. The truth is this. Your body was created to thrive, not to just survive and get disease, but to thrive. You are a masterpiece because you are a piece of the master. So if the foundation is bad, how can the structure be good? Let's focus on the foundation of your health. It is all about cellular respiration. It is all about cellular health. It is all about the mitochondria, the membrane. And I'm gonna teach you how to use keto to support your cellular health. Now the mitochondria, if you're taking notes, in which I recommend you are, and let's make sure we're on the same page here, okay? Everybody type this in. The mitochondria are energy power plants. Okay, type that in. The mitochondria are energy power plants. Shalini says the energy warehouse. That's good too. The healthier your mitochondria, the more fat you burn, the more inflammation you optimize, the healthier you are. Alina, good job. Edna, good job. Veronica, good job. Marcy, good job. I love that you're all on the same page with me. Okay, awesome. Now, we already spoke about this, but reasons come before results. You're going to have to get really clear on your why. When your why is strong, the hows become easier, and one of your homework assignments will be about this. But when we talk about keto, let's get into keto now. When we talk about ketosis, you go on Dr. Google, you type in what is the keto diet, you're going to get over 100 million results. I mean, can you relate? You have one expert saying you got to do keto this way. You have another expert saying you got to do keto this way. And it's enough to keep you confused. And when you're confused, you don't take action and you're paralyzed. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever been frustrated by all the information out there? Well, here's what I'm going to do for you in the next seven days. I'm going to take all that information and give it to you and cut through all the noise and actionable steps that will get you amazing results. It's been proven with thousands of people and through research. When we think about keto, it's not necessarily a diet. This is where, number one, a lot of practitioners and people get it wrong. When your friend tells you, hey, keto, that's a fad diet. No, no, no. Keto is not a diet. Keto is a metabolic process. And ketosis has been around for as long as humans have existed. Every single one of your ancestors did keto. That is a fact. That's why keto is not new. It's just new nuanced. It's simply a metabolic process. Every single one of your ancestors did it. When your friends and family tell you that it's a fad diet, explain this to them. Explain this to them. Really get it through their head. Ketones are the preferred fuel source by the body. There's numerous studies. If you just go on pubmed.gov and type in keto and keto liver, keto uh, kidney, keto bowel, you're going to see a whole bunch of research. It comes down to this. Dr. Pompa, who's my mentor, he wrote the book, the foreword to my book, Keto Flex. If you want to get well, you got to fix the cell. Everybody type that in your chat box, put in your notes, 
put it in the live stream chat. If you want to get well, you got to fix the cell. There's 70 trillion cells in your body. Out of those 70 trillion cells, you could only burn sugar or you could burn fat. That's right, Rob. That's right, Edna. When a cell is stuck burning sugar, also glucose, same thing, it's a very toxic fuel source. It creates a lot of cellular smokes, a lot of inflammation. I compare that to a truck with all this smoke being blasted out of the exhaust pipe. This truck is not healthy for the surrounding environment when your cells are burning glucose and sugar, not healthy for your cellular environment. What we wanna do, and I'm gonna teach you in the next seven days to convert to being a fat burner, to being fat adapted, which is a much cleaner source of energy. I compare to a Tesla cruising through your streets. That Tesla is a much cleaner source of energy for the surrounding environment versus the truck. When your cells are burning fat instead of sugar, it's a much cleaner source of energy for your cellular environment. Now, ketones are high octane brain fuel. Throughout much of human evolution, ketosis likely served as a valuable survival mechanism to fuel brain metabolism during times of food scarcity. Hence, in some ways, the modern diet can be considered keto deficient. That is the real problem right there. The standard American diet is keto deficient. We have forgotten how to tap into this amazing energy system called the ketogenic fat burning energy system. I believe burning fat is our birthright. It is our primal birthright. When you look at babies that are breastfed, I'm giving you three studies down, down below that prove that. Babies that are breastfed are actually in ketosis because breast milk has saturated fat and cholesterol, which helps the development of that baby's brain. Yes, there's sugar and glucose in, in the baby, in the uh, breast milk, but the baby's so efficient at burning it off, it goes in and out of ketosis. But what happens is we get this baby off the breast milk and it starts to eat a high sugary formula or a snacking and eating high carbohydrate diet. And all of a sudden you take a natural fat burning baby, this happened to me, and we teach it to be a sugar burner. And we forgot the energy system of ketones and fat burning. So we wanna reintroduce our natural fat burning state. And in the next seven days, if you're new to keto, I'm gonna teach you how to do that within seven days. And if you're not new to keto, I'm going to teach you how to uh, some advanced strategies to break through any plateaus and get better results. So let's continue on here. I need to switch slides. One second here. Let me close this and open this. I hope you're enjoying it. I love this stuff. We're going long today, but this is probably going to be our longest session out of the seven days, but it's important to start off on the right foot. So let's talk about clean keto versus dirty keto. I am showing this to you the wrong way. I No, you could see it. So let's talk about clean keto versus dirty keto. No, this is wrong. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Bear with me. It's not opening correctly. View, presenter view. Okay, now I got it. Share screen, here we go. Um, I think it's this, let's see. Okay, there we go, that's better. All right, clean keto versus dirty keto. Now when we talk about vegetable oils, I'm gonna show you some really, Alarming research is going to blow your mind. I interviewed two experts last year on my Keto Camp podcast, Dr. Kay Shanahan, who used to be the nutritionist for the Los Angeles Lakers. She wrote the book, Deep Nutrition and Fat Burn Fix. She's the leading authority on vegetable oils and the dangers of vegetable oils. And a gentleman named Brian Peskin from MIT. And I asked them both the same question. What do you think is worse for you? Smoking cigarettes or eating vegetable oils? And Brian Peskin said, Let's look at the research. So what do you think? Let me ask you this question for those watching right now. Give me a percentage. What do you think the chances are of developing lung cancer 
for somebody who smokes two packs of cigarettes every single day for 28 years, what do you think the chances of them developing lung cancer is? Put it in the chat box. I'm curious. And for those watching on YouTube, hit the thumbs up button and also make sure you join the challenge if you didn't do so already. So I see uh, Johan says 16. I see Agatha says 15, 18, 20, 35, 99%, 80%. Okay, here's the answer. 16%. Okay, not as high as you might think, but that's within those 28 years. If you go a little bit longer, it's going to increase, right? Now, let me ask you this question. What do you think the chances are of somebody developing cancer or heart disease if they ate vegetable oils every day for 28 years? What do you think the percentages are here? Sherry says 100% cancer. Melody says 68%. Pam says 80%. 97% says, um, I missed it, went by too fast. 99% Brian and Jill Roach. 20% Luba. The answer is 86%, okay? When I asked Dr. Kay Shanahan if this lines up with her research, she said, actually, Ben, this is closer to 100%. So Dr. Susie says 100%, you're, you're right on with that. Uh, that's because they're highly inflammatory, right? And I'm going to show something to you right here that's going to make you understand why these vegetable oils are so bad for you. So check this out. screw-shaped shaft enclosed within a slotted cage. As the shaft turns, its threads squeeze the flakes with high pressure, forcing out the oil, which then drains out through the slots. 42% of canola seed is oil. This screw press extracts nearly three quarters of that. The remainder is still trapped in the pressed flakes, now referred to as canola cake. The cake exits the other end of the press and moves on to a second extraction. This one, a 70 minute wash with a solvent. This chemical extraction process removes all but a trace of oil. The factory then grinds the cake into protein rich meal, which it sells as animal feed. The extracted oil, stored in large tanks, now enters the refining phase. First, they wash the oil for 20 minutes with sodium hydroxide. During this wash cycle, they spin the oil at high speed so that the centrifugal force separates the natural impurities, which the factory later sells to soap manufacturers. After this cleaning process, the canola oil is visibly clearer. However, it still contains natural waxes, which make it look cloudy. So the next step is to cool the oil to 5 degrees Celsius. This thickens those waxes so they can be filtered out. The waxes don't go to waste either. The factory uses them to produce vegetable shortening. In the factory's lab, technicians recreate production on a small scale to ensure performance and quality. Meanwhile, back in the factory, after washing and filtering the oil, they bleach it to lighten the color, then use a steam injection heating process to remove the canola odor. The oil is now fully refined and ready for bottling. Who wants some canola oil after that? <laughs> that was disgusting. Um, and it's not just canola, it's all the seed oils. I'm going to give you an entire list shortly with better options. I, I, you know, it's when you think about why are there still doctors and nutritionists and dietitians and the American Heart Association still promoting these seed oils? Like whenever I post a video about seed oils in on TikTok, especially if you're not following me on TikTok, it's it's um, my handles right there. I get all these dietitian and nutritionists making these duets, like saying I'm some sort of phony baloney quack job, right? Well, here's some craziness that I learned from Dr. K. Shanahan. It's going to blow your mind. The Ameri so when you go to the supermarket and you see canola oil, you see the stamp of approval from none other than the American Heart Association. Huh. Then you wonder why. The American Heart Association, and these are Dr. Kate Shanahan's words, MD, Los Angeles Lakers nutritionist, 
the American Heart Association is the biggest fake news misinformation organization in the United States. The American Heart Association receives over a billion dollars of funding from big food and big pharma companies every year. The American Heart Association puts out hundreds of journals for these doctors, nutritionists, and dietitians to read, which are all corrupted. That's why when you see a doctor or a nutritionist or a dietitian say these seed oils are totally fine, they're looking at flawed research. They're looking at bad research. Let's get into some real research, right? Um, I'm showing you the wrong thing here. Go back to my slides. I mean, that process is disgusting. Canola cake, come on. Let's go back here. So here are some studies. Let me take myself off the screen there. And this shows, so canola oil or vegetable oils are what's called PUFAs, okay? Let me explain that real quick. This, this is very important. There are three different types of fats. There are polyunsaturated fatty acids. They're called PUFAs. Dr. Kate Shanahan says PUFAs go poof, meaning they oxidize and they are inflammatory. Poly means many. The chemical structure for polyunsaturated fats, which are vegetable oils, the chemical structure includes many, poly, many of what's called double bonds. The more double bonds a fat has, the more opportunities it has to attract oxygen, which is an aggressive molecule to fat, which creates in uh, oxidation effect. Similar to if I bought, I, I bit a piece of it into an apple right now, and I left it on my counter here for a couple of hours, it turns brown. Well, that's kind of what oxidation is at the cellular level with vegetable oils. So that's PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Now then there's monounsaturated fatty acids, meaning just one double bond, much less opportunities to oxidize. Then we have saturated fats. There are no double bonds. It is the most stable fats you can eat. And I'll give you a list shortly of all of them. Now this study showed PUFAs, cancer, uh, excuse me, um, vegetable oils, and cancer of the breast, uh, of breast tissue and colorectal cancer, colorectum cancer. I'm gonna read here. It says, persistent oxidative stress often involving enhanced peroxidation, so the burning processing of PUFAs, vegetable oils, in the cell membranes are known to enhance the development of malignant diseases. Thus, the carcinogenic cancer-causing, that's what that word means, process could be started or accelerated by the fat-burning induced DNA and protein damage. This study looked at linoleic acid, which is the omega-6 vegetable oil, and it showed that linoleic acid increases endothelial dysfunction and inflammatory expression. It also asserts that diabetics have more linoleic acid in their LDL particles than non-diabetics. This study looked at linoleic acid from corn oil, and it showed changes to cardiac fatty acids and causes early diastolic dysfunction without altering systolic function. This study I spoke about with Dr. K. Shanahan. If you haven't read this st study, go read it. It's amazing. They wanted to look at the mitochondria. If you remember, we talked about that. That's the energy power plants. How the mitochondria could use different fats. PUFAs, monounsaturated fats, and saturated fats. And essentially, the, mono, the mitochondria cannot use PUFAs, vegetable oils, as for energy production anywhere near it can use it for monounsaturated fats or saturated fat. So think of PUFAs as cell death. Here's a composition of the fats. The more blue, the more inflammatory. The more red, the better. You might wanna take a screenshot of this, but I'm gonna give you a list here shortly. So here's what I want you to do. Whether you're new to keto, whether you're not gonna do keto, whether you've been doing keto for 20 years, avoid the following fats. Canola, corn, soybean. Now, 
real quick, canola is called rapeseed oil in the UK. Just a reminder. So canola, rapeseed, corn, soybean, cottonseed, safflower, peanut, unrefined peanut oil would be better, but peanut, sunflower, grapeseed, fish oil, and rice bran oil. Now, if you could get an unrefined peanut oil or an organic cold pressed safflower and sunflower oil, those could be okay in moderation. But everything else, avoid as much as possible. Replace them with stable fats. I need to update this list. I'm gonna add the ones I'm thinking about right now, but olive oil, avocado oil, grass-fed butter, grass-fed ghee, duck fat, lard, coconut oil. And I would throw into here probably one of the best cooking oils or cooking fats, beef tallow. Okay, that needs to be updated with beef tallow. I'm a big fan now of beef tallow. Here's why you want to avoid fish oil. 83% of fish oil is rancid on the shelf before you even consume it. Even the best fish oil in the world goes rancid when it is consumed. And a study showed fish oil created four and a half months of cellular membrane inflammation. Here's the study. 21st century warning, four and a half months to rid the patients of damaging fish oil excess. It takes 18 weeks to reverse the negative effect of the incorporation of EPA and DHA from fish oil into the cell membrane. This study showed DHA messed up the mitochondrial enzyme activity. And this study showed in mice that fish oil could lead to colon cancer. Um, so here's what I replace my fish oil with. And I recommend you do the same. Pure form, which is a great plant-based omega. Eat the fish. Eat Eggs have some EPA and DHA too. So fish or salmon. Uh, Vista 1 and 2 from Systemic Formulas or Andrea's Seed Oils, which is a quality seed oil. You could get all of these over at KetoCampSupplements.com. KetoCampSupplements.com. Well, you can't get the fish, but you can get the rest. All right, I'm going to give you two steps here. This is for those who are new to keto, okay? I'm going to give you two steps to get you fat adapted by day seven of this challenge. So by next Monday when we wrap it up, I'm going to, if you follow these two steps, you're going to be fat adapted. Number one, follow the two, 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 two rule. I'm going to unpack that shortly. And I'm going to lose my voice during this challenge. I already feel myself struggling. Number two, decrease, gradually decrease your carbs, 50 grams each day until you, excuse me, gradually decrease until you're uh, uh, below 50 per day. I'm going to explain that too. So number one, two, 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 two rule. Wrote about this in Keto Flex. Every day, starting today, for those who are new to keto, hit this rule for the next seven days. Two tablespoons of olive oil or avocado oil, two tablespoons of coconut oil or MCT oil, two tablespoons of butter or ghee, and two teaspoons, teaspoons of sea salt. What that's gonna do is introduce these delicious fats to your body and increase these fatty acids and your body's going to see all this dietary fat and say, oh, let's go start burning that, helping you produce ketones. Because here's how it works. When your body starts burning fatty acids, those fatty acids are now shuttled to your liver. You're going to learn a lot about the liver during these seven days. The liver then starts using the fatty acids and producing ketones. The ketones, especially beta hydroxybutyrate, has the ability to cross the blood brain barrier which really helps with mental focus, clarity, and also you're getting fat loss. So make sure you are increasing these healthy fats. Teach your body and your liver to start utilizing and producing ketones. That's step number one. Step number two, you still you need to decrease your carbs low enough in order to get into ketosis. Now, most people need to go 50 grams or lower total for the day in order to get into ketosis, but you don't do it all in day one. The average American is eating... 300 grams of carbs per day, you don't go down below 50 on day one. Don't do that. Do a slow decrease. So day one, you, excuse me, let me go back for a second. You want to track your carbohydrates. So if you're not tracking your carbs yet, go to this website. Alina, if you could put this in the chat box, it's a free app, chronometer.com slash keto camp, C-R-O-N-O meter.com slash keto camp to track your carbs. And then you want to take your total grams of carbs, let's say you're having 300 grams of carbs a day right now, 
go from 300 to 250 on day one. On day two, go from 250 to to 200 on day three. And then keep doing that until you get to 50 total grams of carbs for the day. Those carbs that you're getting should come from non-starchy green leafy vegetables. By doing that and increasing your fat, you shouldn't get any symptoms. You shouldn't get the keto flu. In fact, out of the thousands of members in, that have gone through our Keto Camp Academy, none of them get the keto flu when you do it this way. Here's a little pro hack, pro tip for you. It's cut off, but it should say remove spinach and almonds for 30 days. Uh, Himalayan sea salt is fine as long as it's from a quality brand. You're going to count total carbs, not net carbs. So for 30 days, whether you're new to keto or not, if you hit a plateau, this is a good tip for you to remove spinach and almonds. I know this is a tough one because so many keto products have almonds and almond flour, et cetera, but spinach and almonds. Lisa, is today your birthday? Happy birthday, Lisa. I thought it was Tuesday for some reason. So love you, Lisa. I just wanted to say that. Happy birthday. You're going to learn about Lisa on Friday. Happy birthday. I'm going to message you later, but love you, Lisa. Happy birthday and go enjoy your massage. So anyways, going back here, spinach and almonds are higher in the anti-nutrient called oxalates, oxalates. And it could be inflammatory. So in the beginning, we want to avoid them. Or if you hit a stall on keto, you want to avoid them. Replace almonds with Walnuts, pecans, Brazil nuts, peely nuts, and macadamia nuts, even with these moderation, no more than a handful per day. Not of all of them, but of one of these. And then going back to the 222 rule real quick, you don't have all this in one sitting. This is throughout the day, just a reminder. It's like with the food, you, the oils you use to cook with, the salad dressings, the dips, et cetera. It's not all in one sitting. So replace almonds with these, replace spinach with these, arugula, dandelion greens, bok choy, et cetera. And then another, another tough one, don't shoot the messenger here, but remove cow dairy for 30 days and watch it have an anti-inflammatory effect. Replace cow dairy with sheep, goat, macadamia, or even coconut milk. Here are some other hidden sources of inflammation on keto, legumes, corn, soy. You don't wanna burn or blacken your protein farmed fish and nightshades. We're wrapping this up as I get into the sweeteners here and then we'll get into the Q&A for VIP. So what about artificial sweeteners on keto? Avoid the following. Maltitol, sorbitol, mannitol, aspartame, sucralose, saccharin, asulsifame, potassium. A lot of keto products have this. You got to do an audit. Here's a study that showed 3.3% of sucralose was untraceable. That's not good. And there's the PubMed study that shows that. This study showed it increased glucose and insulin and 17 obese women, but not others. So it could be variable. And then these five studies show it could cause weight gain, cravings, alter your gut bacteria. Cooking with it is dangerous. So instead of those, use these. Monk fruit, stevia, erythritol, and xylitol. These are much, much safer for you. All right. I'm going to go into your day one action steps, and then we're going to go into Q&A. Now, before I do, I got to sign off of YouTube. So those watching on YouTube, if you want to be a part of the rest of the seven-day challenge, you got to sign up. Go to ketocampchallenge.com, those on YouTube. And thanks for watching this. We're going to stick with those in the Kickstart Challenge. Stick with me. We're not signing off, but on YouTube, I'm going to sign off here. And thanks. And join with your friends and family on YouTube as well. Love you on YouTube. Hit thumbs up, subscribe, and thank you. Okay, here we go. So for those 